What is NAD? You've heard many experts talk about NAD, including Dr. Sinclair, on the importance of NAD for longevity. What is it? What does it stand for? And how can you get more of it? More importantly, when should you not increase the amount of NAD through supplementation in your body? My conversation today is with an expert on NAD. His name is Dr. Gregory Kelly, who is a senior director of product development at Neurohacker Collective. Dr. Kelly is a naturopathic physician and author of many books, including Shape Shift, and has written many scientific articles around clinical nutrition and chronobiology. Dr. Kelly was former professor at the University of Bridgeport School of Naturopathic Medicine, where I had the pleasure of having as a professor. He's a very intelligent person, scientific to the core on all things nutrition. And we spoke about, you know, supplementation to increase NAD. What are the different types? Should we increase NAD? Dr. Kelly poses the concept, the theory, the hypothesis that Perhaps if you have cancer, it might not be a good idea to increase your NAD levels through supplementation. So enjoy my conversation with Dr. Greg Kelly on NAD and mitochondrial health. Let's go. Welcome to the Dr. Geo podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my intention to help you optimize your prostate health, boost testosterone, help with erections and quality of life as a man, and how to live better with age. I have the great pleasure of having um, Greg Kelly, Dr. Greg Kelly on the pod today. Thanks, Greg, for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's so great to get to catch up up with you again, my friend. It's been a while. It's been a while. We were talking about that before we hit the record button. It's been a while. So one of the beauties of of doing a podcast, we are all too too busy to grab coffee or tea, but I'll be on your podcast and we get to catch up there. So I would have done this years ago if I would have known that that would be the case. Um, Greg, so I remember, so to, to give the audience context that they don't know from the bio, we met, we met in late 1990s when I was interested in becoming a naturopathic doctor, and I called Dr. Peter Diodamo's office because one of the things I learned from Tony Robbins in the mid-90s is learn from the best, right? Whoever, whatever you want to be, learn from the best. And I said, well, um, at that time, the best-selling book was Eat Right for Your Type or Eat Right for Your Blood Type by Peter Diodamo. And I said, I don't know if he's the best, but he has a best-selling book. And there's ND after his name, so I'm going to call his office. And so Peter still kind of says the joke, are you, are you still willing to clean my office for free? Because that's kind of the, what I told Scott, who was the office manager. I said, look, I'm willing to just work for free. I just want to be around, around Dr. Diodamo. And when I went to the office and I was able to shadow him, I actually shadowed you quite a bit because you were working with Peter Diodamo back in those days. So I have fond memories of that. And pretty much that's the, how I got into naturopathic medicine. So take us back as to, before we talk about NAD, of course, which is what we're mostly going to talk about, what got you into becoming a naturopathic doctor and going to a school that was not well established at the time, at the time it was called Southwest, right? Yep. The School of Naturopathic Medicine. You guys, you and Peter, so Peter Diodama is, one of, is from the first graduating class of Bastyr. And I had doubts of going to the, you know, young school at the time, University of Bridgeport. But you guys influenced me to say, to go to Bridgeport because, you know, though it was, they, they didn't even have a graduating class at the time. I figured, well, if you can do it and you guys know what you're talking about and you're successful, well, I'll do it too. So take us back. What You had a few other careers before then. What got you into going to naturopathic medical school? So the long story short version, I was an officer in the Navy. They paid for my college degree. I was an engineer, spent five and a half years, a little more than that, in the Navy. And maybe about a year prior to getting out, I decided to become healthier. I was always the weird officer that ate healthy and exercised, 
but I, you know, I had woke up one day and my back really bothered me. I remember going to the base clinic and they're like, oh, we'll give you some muscle relaxants. And there was no like great explanation for what happened, why. And I went to the library. I've always been a kind of curious guy and stumbled on this book that had chapters on acupuncture and chiropractic and all these things I'd never heard of at that point in my life. And so that kind of changed my trajectory towards like, oh, I've always been doing these two pieces, the diet and exercise. Well, there's entire professions that are trying to you know, figure this health thing out. So when I got out of the Navy, I literally got rid of everything except what would fit in a backpack, moved to Hawaii. I, I'd been in San Diego was my last duty station in the Navy and mm -hmm. just started taking classes. My, I ended up doing a, a master's degree in what you'd think of as most closely maybe nutritional or medical anthropology. But during that time, I plugged into the naturopathic community in Hawaii. And I thought their lives are so cool. <laughs> right. So I'm like, Oh, mm -hmm. like I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it's like, Oh, I could do this for sure. And, and so at that time, so this would have been like going into 93, that new year's I just finished my master's was kind of sitting down. Okay. What's next for Greg on new year's day and decided, okay, I'm going to be in a naturopathic school somewhere come September. And at the time there was just best year where Peter Diadamo graduated in the first class and what was called national college of naturopathic medicine. And both were in the Northwest, which coming from Hawaii, I didn't know how I would do with that, but mm -hmm. the NDs I was yep. the closest with in Hawaii were all national grads. So I'm like, all right, well, that's the place for Greg. So I went and interviewed there. And when I was there, it just turned out there was big drama that had happened the week, week and a half before that. And the person I was staying with uh, uh, at the time I had known her in Hawaii before she went to national said, you know, if I was you, I'd check out this new school that might be opening in the desert in Arizona. Cause right here is a train wreck right now. <laughs> so I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so I got home. I think I called them from Hawaii, you know, a couple of days later, I, got on the phone with someone named Debbie Smolinski, who eventually was just kind of serving as an admin, but, you know, became a naturopathic doctor. Mm. And when I went there, it, it just was like, yeah, I can, I can do the desert. It's warm. I got that covered. There's palm trees. Like if they can make it here, I can make it here. And, and so, yeah, it was kind of a roll of the dice to go to a place that literally each semester as we needed new things, they would come online. Right. So the clinic, right. I was helped actually build out the clinic, but I think you attract mm. people in those early days into risky new things that are exceptional people, right. They're willing to take that risk, mm. willing to kind of go all in like many of your classmates and the people in the class or yeah. two before you at university of Bridgeport. So that long story short, like somewhat, you know, weird coincidences, you know, and overwhelmingly a desire just to understand health better so that I could take care of myself and my loved ones. And you, you graduated. So the, what was impressive, I, if I remember correctly, Greg, that you graduated from that school in three years. Is that right? Yeah. So when I started, it was part of the ploy to attract students to this new thing is you could go year round. So all summer as well, or spread it out over four years as would be typical. So maybe of my, maybe 28 of us chose that three year fast track at the time. Cause the, the truth was by then I was, you know, I think I started, I was about 30. Um, my first year in naturopathic school, I didn't need summers off. I like the sooner <laughs> the better and school academic things have never been particularly hard for me. So I, I, yeah, like if I can do this in three instead of four years, sign me up. Mark Rutterham, we sp was he the, is he the youngest to ever graduate from a naturopathic school? I don't know ever, but he was, he finished his college degree super fast, like two and a half or three years. So I think he turned 21 during our first year of naturopathic school and then he finished in three years, right? Of, in three years, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, brilliant I guy. Have, I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen him. So smart. He was a professor, one of the professors at the University of Bridgeport. So were you, you taught yep. some great classes there and we shared the same birthday and I was like, in I don't remember it was the same day or same year as well, but certainly same uh, month and day. I remember you being so very scientifically minded. So back in the day, and so I was in school, you know, late 1990s, early 2000s, naturopathic medical school. And, you know, some people were less scientific than others, professors, even the interests of some of the students. So 
you know, for example, Bastyr had a reputation of very science, scientifically oriented. I remember you being very scientific and you wrote some excellent articles for Alternative Medicine Review, if I remember, that was associated with Thorne at the time. Mm -hmm. And you continued on that path to the point now that you're working with this company and we're going to talk about NAD. Why, from the history, I would have, I would have guessed that you would have been, you know, more, less scientifically inclined. You always had a scientific, maybe the engineering background, you always had a scientific mindset? Yeah, I would have. Like, I loved chemistry in high school, organic chemistry, yeah. things like that. When I was at Southwest in the first year when we were doing anatomy and physiology and biochemistry, I was the TA for the, you know, the physiology professor and for biochemistry. Those things, for whatever reason, I've always just dug understanding like how things get to where they are flowing through a biochemical pathway. And so it was just, it always made sense to my brain. Right, right. I, and, and you taught it with so much... Um whatever the courses were, I think you taught nutrition one year and mind body. I don't know if I got remember the course. Yeah, right. Was it was like, like a, it was, I mean, I, I think it, I had two, I think of the four classes that the like counseling psychology department taught to the nature pass. And one was definitely like a mind body oriented class where we did, you know, like NLP and heart rate variability, biofeedback and things like that. Right. And you about heart rate variability before, now is every gadget, every wearable, you know, has some sort of device that has some sort of feedback that gives you your heart, HRV. I knew about it back then because of you. So I do remember that. Thank you for that. It's been a while. Greg, NAD. So it became a hot topic online. A few companies just marketing, you know, with different names. But at the end, it was NAD that it's, you know, anti-aging purposes. And I remember, you know, the emails and the phone calls I've gotten from um, some of my patients that, you know, of course, they're seeing me for a prostate problem or some urological or male problem. And they say, hey, what do you think of NAD? Because I'm their trusted source for supplements at that point, right? NAD, I heard about it. A friend said, should I take it? And I'm like, man, I started looking it up and, you know, looking into it. And now, you know, we're talking now, even five, six, six years later, it's still a hot topic. So, Maybe let's take it to very basics. What is NAD? What does it stand for? It's a tongue twister, I think, the actual name. And general overview, what does it do for you? Yeah, so NAD stands for nicotinamide, adenine, adenine dinucleotide. And the nicotinamide is the this, this special sauce, so to speak. So nicotinamide is a synonym for niacinamide, so vitamin B3. Mm -hmm. And when I would have taken biochemistry and when you would have taken it at University of Bridgeport, the main things you would have learned about that molecule were how important it was in fundamentally several different things. One was energy metabolism. So there's a, what's called a redox pair. NAD plus toggles between that state and AD, NADH. And that H, think of H and the electron that comes with it, are what we ultimately extract from food and what food creates from sunlight. And so that's what fuels then our mitochondria to be able to meet or to create ATP, right? Is that, that carrying that hydrogen and electron. So that role was well established long before you and I would have taken biochemistry. The other role that and to you break that down just a little bit, Greg, yep. to break that down, ATP is ultimately what you know, mitochondrial health now is a big thing. So I think even our audience know like mitochondrial health, you know, we used to, everybody learned it as the powerhouse of the cell back in fifth grade. Now it's a huge thing as it relates to many diseases, prevention of diseases and so forth. ATP is the byproduct that comes out of the mitochondria that really gives you the energy you need for absolutely everything. People think, oh, is the energy to run a marathon? No, no. Is the energy for everything, for me to be standing, for my eyelids to go up, for my heart to pump, right? It's the energy for everything comes that from ATP. So the fact that if, I, if I'm reading what you're saying correctly, from NAD, you eventually, after numerous processes, you, you develop ATP. Is that correct? Yeah. So as we, we're fundamentally breaking down, whether it's carbs or fats, those all funnel ultimately into something called the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs yeah. cycle is this big circular thing, <clears throat> but different steps on the on that way, the energy extracted from food is being carried by NAD to the mitochondria where that mitochondria make ATP. And do you have any idea how much ATP we would make in a day? Wow, I don't think so. 
<laughs> that's actually a good a good question. In a day, oh man, in a day, how much ATP? Ah, uh, I I'm gonna pull a number out of the air. A billion. So roughly our body weight of ATP. It's just so crazily fat, quickly made and used that, and it's you know in all cells, it drives so many different reactions that it's just this nonstop spinning wheel where ATP is just made, used, made, used, made, used. So it's crazy. So I make 220 ATPs a day? No. No, no, no. You're no, 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 no. Like you'd have to take the molar weight of ATP, which is crazy, oh. crazy small, and multiply it. Right. But like it, like. In, infinity is not the right number, but it's huge, <laughs> right? So. I, right, right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. what I thought. I, said, I heard you say body weight. I was like, no, that's a yeah. Okay. Yeah, like wow. If, yeah, I could imagine. If you like stacked all the ATP molecules that were used in a day, it would roughly equal your body weight. So, got it, got it. Yeah, it's almost like this. You know, pop. You know, like just general question. Like, you know, how long are you all? If you put all your blood vessels together, how long it is? Right? It's like. You know, 60,000 miles, you know, it's these things, just how, how you were fascinated with biochemistry and chemistry back in the day. I was fascinated with the body and the amazement of how it works. And of course, then I narrowed that down to the amazement of, of the prostate and what the prostate does to men. But anyway, we digress. Yeah. Continue on, Greg. So NAD, you need that. So that takes that takes byproducts from the food you eat into the mitochondria to create ATP. Correct. The other big role you and I would have learned on is NAD can also have a P, a phosphate attached to it. So it becomes NADP and that toggles between NADP and NADPH. And that's much more used to build molecules, things like glutathione as an example. But when you think of NADP, NADPH, think of that as constructing molecules that play roles in cellular protection and detoxification. I mean, it does other things, but that's the, you know, that would be the key thing to think of. So those were the established roles way, way back when we would have taken biochemistry. And then what happened starting in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a third generic role of the NAD molecule that was discovered that isn't one of these flipping back and forth between two forms. And they're called NAD consumption roles. So imagine you put the NAD molecule into an enzyme to do some work and it gets the NAD, the nicotinamide gets cleaved off. Fundamentally, the molecule gets consumed instead of just flipping back and forth. And those, one of those is sirtuins. So that's what kind of put NAD back in a major interest in the late 90s, because sirtuins at that point had been connected to cellular stress responses, fundamentally. Another thing eventually they found is what are called PARPs. And PARPs are DNA, a DNA repair enzyme. So the NAD molecule feeds DNA repair. You need it for that. A third was um, called <coughs> CD38 and a fourth is SARM. So what was discovered is that these, these consumption roles where the NAD molecule is basically being used up to fuel these things that cells need to stay healthy and ultimately keep us healthy. And I think that's why all of a sudden in the early 2000s through 2005, there was this huge interest that was renewed in the NAD molecule. And then also around that time, there was a researcher, Charles Brenner, Boston, Massachusetts guy. I think he was at Dartmouth at the time. And he discovered what's called nicotinamide riboside, or NR, which you mentioned, Elysium basis. That's what is in that product as kind of a new vitamin B3, for lack of better way to describe it. And the crux of making NAD, I, I tend to think of it like, a big airport. So like in your world, like it's LaGuardia, right? Or some airport that a lot of other um, smaller airports are feeding into. So I think of NAD as that major hub, but you can get to that hub starting at niacin, the flushing B3 or niacinamide, the non-flushing B3 or NR. And NR had been known about, I think since the forties or fifties, definitely the sixties, but no one had ever stabilized it. It was just kind of an afterthought. And so what he was the first to understand was he characterized the enzyme that turned NR into NMN. And NMN is the immediate precursor to NAD. And so all of a sudden, it's, oh, we've got this new way that cells make NAD. And maybe that's really important. And that so that put kind of like it back on the menu. And then I think the big thing in this birth is my understanding. It's around 2013, David Sinclair 
gave mice, I believe it was mice, but like an animal model, NMN. And in this case, he actually injected it. It wasn't oral. And what he noticed is that the older mice behaved much more like young mice. Their mitochondria performed better. They were healthier, et cetera. And when he published that, all of a sudden, it was like, wow, that's really cool, right? Like doing things to boost NAD made a big difference in these animals. You know, I wonder if that would happen for humans. And at the time, NMN was a research chemical. It wasn't available as a supplement, but NR was. And so the, the person that founded Elysium, I believe Guarenti is one of the founders. He was, Sinclair was in his lab back in the 90s, right? So they jumped on that since NMN wasn't available. NR was the next closest thing, right? Since it's one step away from, from NMN. So that's the, the history of where it came from. And then, you know, since then, there's been you know, dozens of human studies on giving and are, you know, not quite as many, but a fair amount on giving NMN. And, you know, they're, I'm, for the audience, they're just new B3s is how I would think about them. New vitamin B3s. Yeah. What? So currently what's in the market from a supplement perspective is NR. And is there any other component that... Well, that, that, that leads to the production of NAD in, in the market? Yes. Yeah, well, so the old B3s, flushing niacin and NAD, or I'm sorry, niacinamide, like I said in that NAD, they're the end part of NAD. So it's mm -hmm. always been known that those things boost it. Niacin comes in kind of one direction to do it. Niacinamide mm -hmm. comes in another, and NR comes in a third. But both niacinamide and NR meet at the NMN airport so to speak, before they then head on to the next plane to get to LaGuardia, if that makes sense, where niacin's coming in, in its own direction. It's, it gets to LaGuardia in a completely different way. But at the end, it all, the, the final product is NAD? Yeah, the final for product, all of these. That's, that's the hub. They all get there eventually. So why, not, so why not just use niacin, which is very inexpensive? Yeah, so niacin will definitely boost NAD, but you get, to get enough to do that, you'd have fairly major flushing. But yeah, I mean, it's one of the things when, when this first came on the map, I was like you, like, why, why aren't we, why are we ignoring that these other things that aren't nearly as expensive do it as well? And, and the one thing I would say is that all of these molecules, some of them gets to the gut microbiome and they do different things there. So NR is a, a bigger molecule than like niacin or niacinamide and different gut microbiota likely prefer that. So I think like to me, part of the why isn't just building NAD. It's that these things are also having slightly different systemic effects when we consume them orally. Got it. So we need NAD to eventually create ATP. Is there, so I, from listening to that information, I would think, Hey, you know, this is important for every cell in my body, but isn't an R the I know that supplements you, you don't use to diagnose or treat patients. We get that. But it, isn't it, according to research, associated with certain conditions, brain conditions or dementia or Alzheimer's or things like that? What are the, what are the biggest associations to the use of, for example, again, we're going to be clear to the audience and to the, you know, to governmental officials. We're not saying to treat a disease with a supplement, but based on research, what is it associated with? Well, so the, I mean, the biggest thing is that as we get older, NAD just decreases in many tissues in the body. And when you think of like writ large, what does NAD do in cells? Is it something that they use to produce or to protect themselves from metabolic stress is how Charles Brenner would say it, but stress of all types. So when a cell is stressed, one of its responses to protect itself and make itself more resilient is to try to make more NAD, not only for the ATP component, but I mentioned that one of the other, the NADP variant is involved in cellular protection and detoxification. The sirtuin pathway that it can be consumed is a stress response pathway. So that like virtually you could probably name like choose your condition That's and right. more often than not, what you would find is if that system is struggling or that tissue or organ, then NAD is being taxed maybe beyond the capabilities or the resources to make it at that point in that individual. And that if we're, as we're older, we can, like I've done a fair amount of NAD testing. I've, been in communication with a lab in Atlanta that's, I think, done more NAD testing than any lab on the planet. And you know, even me eating while exercising, if I'm not 
supplementing my diet with resources to make NAD, my levels are just far lower than they would have been when I was, you know, than when I first met you when I was, you know, mid thirties. And that would be the case for everyone I've measured so far. And what are the natural ways of, is there a natural way of getting NR from food or exercise into the system other than supplementation? Or is it, we can only get vitamin, regular vitamin B3 from food? And if so, what are those foods that, yeah, can, so, or what are the foods that eventually, I guess, what's the natural methods, including food and diet that can increase NAD? Yeah. So this is a great question. So we'll just kind of parse into animal products and not like vegetarian, non-animal products. So in animal products, they'd have usually the whole suite. So when I think of that NAD, I think of the idea of an NAD metabolome. So the, the ohm would be like the microbiome, like the whole collection of things. So NAD is the hub airport, but you've got, you know, the, the B3 forms we mentioned, NMN, all these other metabolites like NADP, NADPH, you name it, right? So it's a whole collection of things. And so what you'd see typically in animal products is they would have a lot of that whole metabolome, right? They'd have the big molecules, but then when we eat those, we tend to break down the big molecules into little ones. So most of what we would absorb would be, you know, the smaller molecules like the niacinamide or, or nicotinic acid, the flushing niacin. NR is really the main place it's found is breast milk. Like that was in their original patent that Brenner and Dartmouth filed, that, that's where they identified, but it's fairly trace amounts. So NR is more an airport that things are flowing through than one that things are building up, if that makes sense. So because of that, it's just not in high amounts in most foods. Where in plants, usually, and this was what led to the discovery of vitamin three deficiency disease way back that, you know, in the early 1900s, that it's, that's called the three D's. If you don't get enough vitamin B3 in your diet, you've got like a dermatitis, right? A, a skin rash, you get what they called dementia at the time. Don't, it's not like, you know, dementia in age, it's just a vitamin B3, like our brains not um, functioning well. And the third D is diarrhea. Right. So that was known a long time ago. And the reason it got became prominent is because in the early 19th history, century, there was some parts of the U.S. and other places in the world that were eating a lot of corn and other things that weren't being processed like they would have been traditionally. So the Native Americans would have used limestone to process corn, so alkali lime. And that unbinds the niacin that's in corn and freeze it up so we can absorb it. So the forms of the B3 metabolome or the NAD metabolome in plants are slightly less bioavailable and slightly different forms. So it would be hard eating a good diet to be deficient in vitamin B3, but eating a good diet as we get older, it won't get you to an optimal amount of NAD, if that makes sense. Yeah, the way I look at taking dietary supplements as a whole, because, you know, you might, you might get the question uh, as well. I get it all the time. I prescribe supplements. Can I get it all through food? And of course, it depends, right? It depends on what are you trying to accomplish? And certainly in my world, we're trying to help with some urological problem. Once I've earned that right to be their wellness male doctor, then we have a different conversation. What are you trying to accomplish? Do you want to normal and kind of get by or you want optimal? Optimal does require, in my opinion, supplementation, particularly as you get older, just like protein requirements are different as you get older. So I, as a general overview, in terms of this constant question, I get asked probably one, once a week, can I get it all through food? Okay, well, it's difficult to do so. So this is where I guess you, if you take NA, NR through supplementation, you can develop more NAD and you're kind of ensured that you're going to have enough of this byproduct available for yeah. all the or its health benefits. So one of the things I think it's really important to understand is that for things that are super important for cells, there's usually some redundancy. So there's mm. plans and backup plans. And with making NED, that's the case. So you know we can make it from the flushing niacin or niacinamide or NR. And I think certain cells, different tissues in the body, body prefer one versus the other. And so I know when I, you know, create a product to boost NAD, I want to make sure I'm supporting that redundancy. That's just a sensible approach to me. So that's what we do in the Quiet NAD product. And the other thing, and I 
think this is a super cool study. So mm. there's a um, really renowned um, longevity researcher, James Clement. He led a study and it was called something like the plasma NAD metabolome is dysregulated in aging. And what they did is they looked at different things in the NAD metabolome. So NAD, NMN, you know, things made from it, things that would be made after it. And no surprise, what they found is in that study compared to the young people in the older group, NAD levels were lower. But what I found particularly interesting is that there was other things that were also lower, but there was other things that were actually higher in the older people than mm. in the younger. So I'm looking like, well, this doesn't make sense. If there's more than enough NMN, like there's more here in the old people than the young, why isn't it getting to the next airport in the line? Why isn't it being made into NAD? So I started looking at that and thinking about it. And then I remembered this other paper I'd read a while back that had ATP drawn in to the NAD metabolome pathways where that played a role in doing the work needed to move the, the planes to the next airport. And sure enough, everywhere ATP plugged in, the one side of it, where before ATP would do it work, that was higher in the older people. And on the other end, they couldn't get there. That was lower. And so while ATP is made by an NAD, right? And that's one of the roles. We can't make NAD and get that flow through this complicated network of NAD molecules without enough ATP. So like long story short, to make NAD from NR goes through two steps. So two enzymes, both require ATP. To go from niacinamide to NAD goes through two steps. One requires ATP. To go from flushing niacin to NAD is three steps. Two of the three require ATP. So when we created Qualia NAD+, Plus, one of the things that I think distinguishes it from any other NAD booster on the market is I paid attention to what can we do to actually support ATP? Because without ATP, we're just not going to get the flow through this complicated system of airports, yeah. right? And the And you probably know this, but in physiology, ATP, whenever you see ATP in a biochemistry book somewhere in a pathway, in think and ATP magnesium complex. ATP is always bound to magnesium in a complex to activate enzymes. Yeah. So that's why you'll see, like as an example, magnesium in the quite NAD product. And many people just don't get enough magnesium in their diet. So what I think sets our product apart is we paid attention to the, what I would think of as the bottlenecks in this pathway and made sure that they're supported. And then at the end of the day, the question I always ask myself, and you probably you know, heard me say this back in naturopathic school, like, like, show me the money, I think is what I would have said many times, like, you know, every, you know, every vendor back then was like, oh, mine goes to 11, an old spinal tap, insider joke. But, and the way that's changed over time is I tend to always say, does this thing do what it's supposed to do? Right. Because if it does, it's probably a good investment. And if it doesn't, it's largely a waste of money. Right. And the most fundamental thing NAD boosters should do is increase the amount of NAD. So, you know, NR on its own, great ingredient, 300 milligrams will on average increase it about 48, 50%. So mm. not too shabby. We did a double blind placebo controlled study on our product. And so far in the first cohort, we're averaging 86%. So much better. And mine- and What's there's, the age group of, of, of those? And is it is it compared to a control group where they're not they're taking a placebo or something? A pl yeah, we have a placebo group. And the placebo doesn't really make much difference in NAD and any of the studies ours included. You know, so it does that. But then the, you know, part of Greg is like, okay, well, that's cool, right? Increasing that. But what does that molecule do? Like, what, what should that translate into, right? Because if you, you know, just boost that in isolation and it doesn't show up in, you know, the lives of people, you know, like you're working with or listeners or me into better performance, like not as interesting, right? So one of the other things that I used when I studied our product was something called the aging male symptom scale. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yes. AM AMS is how I call it. And just for the listeners that may not be, it was developed by Germans 1999-ish. And the general idea is that women have well-characterized symptoms when they go through menopause that show up, you know, physically, emotionally, sexually, and that men do as well. It's just underlooked. And so the AMS was created to be a questionnaire to get at those things. And there's three buckets. There's a total score, but then there's a like a sexual subscore, a physical subscore, and what I think of as a psychological. Some, men, some, some practitioners use the AMS score to determine uh, hypogonadism or low testosterone. I think of it very much as a low T 
yeah. is, um, scale in terms of how it's largely used for sure. So that's, that's what I use like as a sanity check. Okay. Like, all right, we're measuring NAD. Is that translating into something? And what we saw in our pilot study, so this wasn't placebo controlled was about a 50 to 60% improvement in each of those main bucket areas. So, and the, the individual questions for the listeners would be things like, you know, are you like, how irritable are you? You know, how, you know, are you feeling fatigued or like that your sleep is restorative, things like that. And, and so to me, that was cool. Cause in then the real world, like, did it do what it was supposed to do to me? That's ultimately the most important thing. And so right now we're doing a placebo controlled study where we're also using that scale to see if we replicate that in a, a better conducted study. And, and so that to me is what's cool about NAD is that when, you know, if you boost it and maybe it takes the right way of boosting it, that it translates into better performance as we men get older. You know, we, we all are looking for an edge as we get older, right? So it sounds like to me, look, I recommend magnesium to every patient. I think every patient should be on magnesium, some sort, bound to something, three or an eight for this, glycinate for that, whatever, but magnesium key. And, you know, I, I, I realized I was a middle-aged man years ago. Well, I didn't know the right, the, the age range for that. I was like, oh, wow, I'm there. So, you know, take tons, tons of supplements for that edge. So it sounds like to me, let, let's let, and, and to the, for the audience, as they know from the bio, you are the medical director of Qualia. Qualia is a brand. Yep. And you're the medical director. The, then. So I would, my title would be vice president of product development. So I'm, product but I'm the science -y, like lead person. So we don't yeah. have a CMO per se in our company. Okay. There is no, I, I'm not associated financially, just so that our audience knows uh, in any way with, with the company. I just know you and I know how you function. I know how you work and uh, your integrity behind what you put out from scientific papers to products. So, and, and this notion of how do I get more NAD? What do I tell my audience that you know, they're into it? So that's why we decided to have you on. So again, thanks for being on. So is it impossible? So I think that certain nutrients, particularly as you get older, you just need to supplement magnesium. And I said that already. And, you know, vitamin D probably doesn't matter age, but et cetera. Is, so we eventually want more NAD in our system because life is better that way. Maybe lower the risk of certain diseases that uh, we are, we're trying to uh, lower that risk. Quality of life is better based on your uh, studies with uh, using the AMS questionnaire. It seems like a no brainer, but anything well, that think, sounds too good to be true, sometimes yeah. is too good to be true. So what am I missing here? When is, when is it the wrong time to take something that will boost your NAD, whether it's an NR ingredient or uh, probably vitamin B3, I guess I'm bouncing around a little bit. Is there ever a time not to take niacin? I know people take it to lower their uh, cholesterol, for example. And you can talk about that in any relationship there. And is there a right time to take something like NR, particular age, you know, 52 years old, that's when you start. And yeah. when is it not? Those are three questions. Well, we, you could take it wherever you want. Yeah. So before we get to those, I want to just start with like a Greg mental model to mm. share with our listeners. So mm. we tend to be very much a more is better mindset. And we, I'm not missing everyone listening, but just collectively as a society, like if vitamin, if a hundred milligrams of vitamin C is good, a thousand milligrams must be, if not 10 times better, at least much better. Right. Yeah. And physiology doesn't work like that. Yeah. So there's, for most things, think a Goldilocks rule. There's like a zone we want to be in to make sure that things are working well, but we don't want to overshoot that zone. So right. whether that's boosting NAD, you know, taking, you know, almost any vitamin, there's probably a just right amount that could vary and be different for a 25 year old versus a 60 year old for a female versus a male. But in general, just always think of that. There's, I often hear, you know, like, oh, I heard this was good, or I heard this is bad. And it's like, oh, well, that's probably the context will matter. Yeah, I always so get the analogy, Greg, uh, thank you for saying that. I always get the analogy of, th there was a woman that died last summer from over drinking water. She just drank mm. too much water. So then her sodium levels got so low that it killed her. So even drinking yeah. too much water. So the, yeah, there's a fine amount for every substance, including water. And this is no different, probably. Yeah. And so when you then think of NAD, the 
the way I would think of it, like the main, my main story for why Greg would take something to have more resources to build NAD is when cells are under more stress, they need more resources to make NAD. And I don't know when, like I can do a lot of things to try to make sure that my cells aren't stressed, but there's going to be things that are unanticipated that come out of the blue. And I want to make sure they're powered up and have the resources to upregulate NAD production if they need it. And so for me, that's the why, right? In terms, you know, in terms of doing things to make sure my levels stay closer to what they would have been, you know, 40 years ago in my life at this point. And then the, like what age, I mean, I think it's almost decade by decade. There's, you know, it's not going to be the same for everyone, but in general, NAD levels go down progressively with aging is what's shown up in studies and with the labs taking it. And so I think, you know, especially, you know, for me, I often use 35 as a benchmark, like somewhere in there, it just makes sense to me to start supporting some of the things that are starting to tail off physiologically from when we're younger and then maybe get more aggressive if we need. So, you know, it's like if listeners would say, oh, I want to, you know, maybe experiment, you, you don't have to take something like an NAD booster or NR necessarily every day, right? If you're 35, maybe take a, you know, a couple of days a week, maybe do a week a month or a couple of weeks a month and then see, do you notice a difference? Yeah. The problem with like that, that, Greg, is compliance. I'd rather yeah. take the supplements I take every day as long as I know I'm not harming myself, just because of the consistency and the ha the habit forming that it that it induces, as opposed to you know every other day or twice a week or a couple of times a month. For sure, I'm the same way. And one thing that I think may be important with NAD boosters, it's there's one animal study, so it's not not like you know impeccably sound bedrock to make it. But we do know that NAD has a circadian rhythm in the blood and it tends to peak somewhere, you know, early afternoon, say like shortly after lunch. And there was one animal study that gave IV NAD and they did it at the beginning of the animal's activity cycle or at the end, you know, so think of, you know, the equivalent of first thing in our morning or first thing in our evening. And what they found is when they gave it in what would be the equivalent of our breakfast time period, it improved metabolic health, so glucose, insulin, liver markers, um, body composition, things like that. But when they gave that same dose infused at the end of the day, it tended to worsen those things. Oh. And in that study, then they just said, okay, well, we'll give just niacinamide, the, like the form of B3 we mentioned earlier, at those same two times, and the same thing happened. So I'm strongly biased. I've always had a body clock orientation. You may not remember, I but do, when I talk clinical nutrition, I it was the second class was on uh, yeah, body yeah. clock. That's right. You know, if sleep was the first thing we talked about, like how to right. Right. affect sleep nutritionally. Uh, William, so I, William Dement book. Yes. I, yeah. I remember. Fantastic. That, <laughs> that's right. And the circadian book that I may not remember the author's name that you recommended, but anyway, uh, I yeah. do remember that. And I've used that. Um, I'm telling you, you, there was an influence that you had certainly as a professor with, with sleep. Again, now we know all this sleep, you know, with Matthew Walker and all these experts, but I knew about sleep back then. And I knew about circadian rhythms back then. Thanks to you. But yeah, thank you for mentioning. You're welcome. The NAD so the, element of cir circadian rhythm rhythm connection to NAD. Yeah. So for me, I, when I take our our NAD booster, the quality NAD, I take it early in my day, definitely before. I'm usually like up by seven, so I'll, I'll typically take it somewhere in that first hour or two window. But I would just, if, if people are going to experiment with whether it's that product or other NAD boosters, I'd encourage them to just do it that once a day early in their day, rather than the divided doses that you you know, routinely see on supplement recommendations. So, and right. then you also said, oh, you had also said like, are there any contexts where it might not be a great idea? And we had talked about this before coming on. And there's definitely, you know, strong thoughts that doing things to boost NED when you have a known cancer would not be a, a smart idea. So that so would you be currently a have a, so my world is prostate cancer, okay. yep. right? You currently have prostate cancer, let's just say, whoever's listening. Not a good idea to take an any NAD booster. Well, if you're getting like you know, like say like a low potency multivitamin, and there's you know vitamin B three in that, or sure. you're getting it, you know, things like that. Not, I wouldn't worry about it. But doing a strategy to intentionally try to upregulate NAD might not be a great idea in that context. I would say you know, 
there's no consensus yet, right? Too early. It's often takes many years, but it wouldn't be a smart risk in my in And the my reason terminology. for that, I mean, I can guess it, but I'll let you say it. Yeah, so cancer kind of changes the playing field to support its own growth. And you mentioned earlier how important ATP is to fuel things. So, you know, one of the roles of NAD is making sure that ATP can be produced. And so, you know, the, the I know there's some pharmaceutical, you know, interventions that are early days of study to try to starve cancer cells of the NAD molecule. So that would be the one context that I would say, you know, with what I know, I would be very uncomfortable if someone came to me and said, oh, I have like in your world prostate cancer and I'm, you know, I want to boost NAD and I'm hearing these influencers. Is it okay if I take this? I, I lean towards no, strongly <laughs> lean towards no. Right. Because you so. want, you don't want to boost the energy source for these cancer cells, though. We don't yeah. know if it, you know, where this NAD is or where the, the supplement, the, the niacin or the NR, if it routes into the cancer cell or just into healthy cells or we don't know what happens. So we're kind of, we're, we're kind of just playing it safe. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to think in risk versus reward, like is, you know, if something's low risk and the rewards like ambiguous, it still may be worth it. Right. But if some, if there's a potentially high risk, the reward has to be massively big for me to consider that investment. And I don't think this is a, that would be a great investment in my risk reward scenario. Let's kind of make believe a little bit here, right? So this is a patient prostate cancer was treated successfully, whatever treatment, prostatectomy, PSA undetectable for two years, which suggests that he no longer has prostate cancer. Would you consider, and now they're, you know, most of my prostate cancer patients, they're interested in longevity and quality of life and aging, anti-aging. So they're not only interested in not having prostate cancer, they're interested in crushing it as they get older. And to give you an analogy, Greg, there's a lot of conversation of the role of testosterone as it relates to prostate cancer to the point where even it's, in some cases is recommended after prostate cancer, okay, for quality of life purposes and, you know, shared decision making. NAD or an NR supplement to promote NED patient two years out, you know, no, you know, NED, right. No evidence of disease <laughs> to, to, to use all these acronyms. Would you consider it? I, I personally would. Yeah. Yes. But it would be an, like an, an unknown unknown. Right. Like, yeah. but you know, at that point I would think, okay, the, the chances are that, like one of the things, just again, that idea of metabolic stress, like NAD is just super important for healthy cells to deal with metabolic stress. And that may be more, and to repair DNA and other things, right? So NAD is just really important to keep healthy cells healthy, you know, including our immune cells that have a job to survey and find stressed cells of all types. So I would think, yeah, in that context, you know, the, if there are, we can't ever have complete certainty, but you know, the odds would be in favor. And then you mentioned testosterone. There's not a lot of studies that I've seen on the different NAD, you know, like a niacin or nicotinamide even, yeah. never mind the newer things like NR on testosterone. But to make testosterone, I, I think it's 17 HST, right? There's the enzyme 17 hydroxy yeah. steroid dehydrogenase. That's right. And there's multiple mm -hmm. variants of that. So different variants in different tissues, slightly different variants in men and women. And by variant, what I mean is the same thing that activates one variant in one tissue may not be exactly, but the NAD molecule is involved in activating some of those. And so, you know, what you'll see is a few studies that have looked at older mice and and the testes specifically, and what they have found both with flushing niacin and niacinamide is giving you know, much higher doses to the old mice results in higher testosterone production in that particular tissue. So presumably the variant in that tissue of that enzyme is very NAD driven. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I think there's a, a connection there. I'd love to see more studies. It's just not sure. been an area that's got much attention so far. So, Men with active prostate cancer, more inside of be a little bit more cautious, maybe not a good idea. Men post prostate cancer successfully treated might be a good idea, just like testosterone is in, in yeah. such men. Yep. Yeah, just to support health and you know counter the quality of life AMS type of yeah. A hundred percent. 
I think my last question is what commercial tests, how do I test NAD commercially in a, so a commercial lab where I can use it clinically? Is there such a test? The, I mean, most of the studies that have been done on NAD are university settings where they'll get the reagents and do it themselves. But a company in Atlanta called Ginfinity has um, finger stick test wow. kits. That is what we've been using at La Qualia print. And what I, like when I did my before and after with our product, it's what I used to show that mine had gone up 150%. So that's one option. And then it's, I, I don't think I'm allowed to say the other vendor that's bringing one to market yet, but the, we, in our study, we're using a different company's finger stick test kit that I think, you know, in the next year will also be available. So those are, those would be the two options, but right now, Ginfinity, it, and it's, it's, it ends in an I, not a Y. So it's ginfinity.com okay. and it's like, I think it's precision medicine testing or something like that. And they're in Atlanta. Great. Wow. I have to say, Greg, that uh, though, you know, there's only so much you could be an expert on. We were chatting before we started recording that, you know, you were able to, you have the brain and the mind to be able to have a lot of knowledge about many things. And since you were been a naturopathic doctor, you've done many things. I don't know that I do. That's why I stick in my <laughs> lane with urological situations. And so Though the NAD conversation and the questions to ask were intriguing because I do, I, if for nothing else, for my personal use and reason, right? Like I, I'm very interested in crushing it for as long as possible. I, I haven't taken a deep dive into it and the products that are out there, but I have not recommended it to, to prostate cancer patients for reasons that you've mentioned. So I say that to say I, in the last, I don't know, 50, 60 minutes or so, I, I feel like I know so much more about NAD and some of the products that can increase the amount of this pro of this byproduct that is so essential for a longevity. So thank you for that. Final thoughts and how can people get in touch with you or the company that you are affiliated with? Yeah, so the, the company's name is neurohacker.com. Mm -hmm. Our brand is Qualia. We'll actually be changing the branding away from Neurohacker to exclusively Qualia in the, the next few months. I, I believe our new URL sometime in, you know, say June will be qualia.inc. But sure Neurohacker the, is the, the best. .com is taken probably and oh, yeah, yeah. $10 it's, million um, dollars or so to get it maybe. It's like a real estate company in Australia owns that URL. And then we're very big on um, Instagram. So the neurohacker.com Instagram account. I'm more, I, I kind of run the X or Twitter neurohacker account. So if you um, find neurohacker.com on Twitter for the people listening that are on that and see postings, in all likelihood, it's me that posted it. And mostly I try to do things that are interesting to me. So, you know, things other experts are saying, new studies, things like that on Twitter. And then on neurohacker.com, I, I do a fair amount of blogging. So if you want to find out more about NAD, I've written some really comprehensive articles you can find on the neurohacker.com website. If you want to find out more about the ingredients in Koi NAD or our studies, those are also at the neurohacker.com blog. You said Twitter. It's no longer Twitter, Greg. You know, I that. know it's <laughs> how I mean, how can you say anything but Twitter or a tweet? What are you going to exit? <laughs> like, it's it's still very weird to call it anything that. So what's your Twitter handle or your X handle? Oh, so it's I just use the neurohacker.com one. So it's just if you just do at neurohacker, you should come up okay. with it. So, so that's you. That's you. You, yep. you are at neurohacker. When it comes to X, yes, I inherited it because we we just ignored it, and I'm a big I'm a big fan of X. It's just a great place to follow expertise and a lot of hundred percent. I'm not involved as much on X or Twitter. It's just time, but I get the quick and best information on colleagues, uh, prostate cancer, and so forth more so than I do on the other platforms. I'm just more active on Instagram and and Facebook currently in terms of me putting information out there, maybe I'll change that. Greg, thank you, my man. I really appreciate you, your knowledge, your expertise, your passion for what you do. And, you know, when people ask me this supplement versus that supplement, this and the other, it's so confusing even to me. And I've been in the game for over 20 years. And some of it is honestly the same with a different label. I go by who's behind it. And if it's a trusted person, 
that I know is, you know, ethical and with integrity and knowledgeable, I say, I say yes, because, you know, this person. So when Greg Kelly's behind something, I'm paying attention. So well, I appreciate thank you. you. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. All right, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hopefully, hopefully you know everything about NAD now. And a lot of the questions that you've asked me about NAD and NR and supplementation. Yeah, hopefully you got this covered now. Take good care and take good care of others if you can. This is Dr. Geo signing off. Talk to you next time. So long. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Dr. Geo podcast. You can watch all episodes of this podcast and much more by subscribing to my YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash Geo Espinoza ND. If you love what you heard today, you can help by leaving a five-star review of the podcast on Apple and Spotify, as each review helps us reach more men who are serious about improving their urological health and how to function better with age. And for the latest research and actionable takeaways in the world of men's health and integrative urology, sign up for my newsletter at drgeo.com. I'll see you next time.